Hello, welcome back to our last Keep Looking Up. We, uh, my name is Tiffany, and joining me this evening is Kurt Spivey, our engineer. Hey, everybody. And Nishan Adhikari, our senior student worker. Hello. <laughs> and for at least a couple of months, our only student worker. Yes, we, we have a whole <laughs> new crew coming next fall, but uh, for now, we got Nishan. Uh, he's going to help us. We can't us. do without. We can't Absolutely. Nishad's going to be sharing some resources with you guys in the chat, and uh, he'll be monitoring chat during our Star Talk. So if you have any questions or comments, um, please put those in the chat, and Nishan can relay those for us. Um, we, like I mentioned, this is our last Keep Looking Up. We are uh, stopping our virtual programming for the summer. Um, and we plan to reopen in the fall. So we're gonna reopen to the public in September. In fact, uh, just this week, we got the thumbs up to open the planetarium to uh, limited capacity, at limited capacity to, um, to private groups. So if you know a, a private educational group, a, a school or a classroom who, who might be interested, we, there's still some hoops to jump through, but uh, we, we are offering some private shows uh, What's the minimum number on a tour, Tiffany? Right now, I think it's it's either 32 or 34. We're at 25% capacity. I'm thinking so that, that's, that's the maximum. Too. What's the minimum number you can have in a tour? Minimum number? Yeah. I mean, normally, I, I in, in the before times, I would say like 15, 12 or 15, but now I'm not necessarily going to limit that because we're, we're trying to be flexible. But uh yeah, so we're, we're sort of practicing with, with the private groups and we're gonna to prepare to reopen to the public in the fall. And all of those limitations will start to lift a little bit over time as you're seeing around and it's exciting. Just a, a little behind the scenes for everybody too. The other day we were both in the planetary going, oh, our laser pens, we missed our laser pens. So yeah. we're very, very much looking forward to being back under the dome too. We are, I, yeah, I am holding that laser pen. I was like, oh my gosh, I missed this so much. So I cannot wait to see you guys under our dome. But in the meantime, we can bring our dome to you or to a, a planetarium to you using a virtual planetarium software called Stellarium. I'm gonna share my screen now so you can see what that looks like. Stellarium is a free and open source software so if you think this looks cool, go to stellarium.org and download it for free on your computer. Uh, it's even on the app store. It's a couple dollars for your phone, um, but it's really useful. It's, it's like a planetarium in your pocket. It's really cool. Uh, so I have my sh uh, screen shared here. This is current time. You can see the sun uh, peeking behind this tree. Um, I turned off the atmosphere. So this is what it would look like. What I'm not sure what those are, but this is what it would look like. Uh, you'd see the moon, and um, Kurt, do you know what those are? It's kind of weird. Thoughts? I think they just left the planets up there. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's where the planets are. Yeah, that's oh. planets. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, Kurt, I'm going to let you take this over. So anyway, um, you can explain why I'm turning off the atmosphere if you want. And uh... Yes, uh, before we actually get into the sky lore, the lore of the stories, the stars, we do have a really cool uh, planetary thing going on right now. And the reason Tiffany is starting this while the stars are still up, you'll notice the brightest thing very close to the sun there is Venus. Uh, it's going to be gorgeous this next week. If you go out, out right at sunset, which tonight is at 8.34 p.m., a few minutes earlier every night this week, uh, this shouldn't, after the moon, will be the first thing you can see in the nighttime sky. The problem is it's still very close to the sun. It is the third brightest thing in the sky after the sun and the moon, but it's going to be very, very low on your western horizon. Uh, but you should be able to see that right after sunset. Uh, then, say about quarter of nine, nine o'clock, uh, on the other side of the moon, you'll see a very bright red dot, if you would highlight that, Tiffany. Uh, and, uh, that so, 
I figured out what those dots were. They're annotations you were drawing on the page. So I'm going to clear all those off. <laughs> really? We yeah. did annotations? I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> it's fancy. Yeah, I guess. So yeah, that's uh, Mars on the other side of the moon there. Oh, and she's got a little marker and everything. Isn't that cute? Yeah, I can, I can draw. Oh, look at that. So there's Mars. <laughs> yes. I'm going to erase On the other them. side. Yes. And uh, if you draw a line from Mars through the moon and head down, the next bright object you come to is right there. And that is the most elusive object you can see without a telescope in the nighttime sky. That is the planet Mercury. Now, Mercury is a fairly bright planet. The problem is it's the closest planet to the sun, so it is never very far from the sun. So you're always going to be looking for it in twilight conditions. Uh, the reason I am pointing this out to you is this is its westernmost extension for the entire year of 21, 2021. So this is as high as it's going to get in our western sky for the entire year, and your best opportunity to see Mercury is over the next week before it starts falling back, back in, starts going around the backside of the sun, and then we're not going to see it for a while again. Uh, then it'll pop out in the morning sky. But uh, if you get a chance, Venus is climbing a little bit higher. Mercury is at its highest. So you get a chance to see all four of those planets in the evening sky if you go out right at sunset. I guess with the front that's coming in overnight, tonight might not be the next, best night, but I've heard that many days next week you'll have a good shot at seeing those. All right, and uh, this, so the sun is, uh, we have motion uh, in our sky due to Earth's rotation, which is why the sun comes up in the east area and sets over in the west, and we'll see the sunset setting very soon here around 8.30. Um, but we, the, the stars also shift very gradually because Earth is going around the sun. So the stars actually rise about four minutes later every day. And There's so, an easy way to remember this too. How many degrees are in a circle? 360. And how many days are in a year? 360 ish. 365. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and a quarter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but that means the sun moves one degree from east to west across our sky every single day. Now, to just us that we don't perceive that very much, but over the course of two weeks, four weeks, that really adds up. And, and I, yeah, we say that uh, to, to point out that um, right now the sun is appearing to sort of move into our wintertime sky. It's really that the wintertime sky is falling behind the sun, so we're not going to be able to see it very well. You really can only see it like right as the sun is setting right now. But we uh, wanted to start here because there's some really bright constellations in our winter sky. Uh, and Kurt, do you want to talk a little bit about the constellations that are entering the sun right now. Yes, right now uh, the sun is entering the constellation. It's about halfway through the constellation of Taurus. Now, now for those of you who follow the zodiac, you know that's supposed to end at the end of April when the sun's in Taurus now. That's a whole thing called precession we're not going to go into tonight. But right <laughs> now you cannot see that constellation in the nighttime sky. Uh, Taurus the bull is one of our very prominent winter constellations though. Very easy to see. And just off to his left where Tiffany is pointing is probably the easiest to spot constellation of the entire night sky. If you go out when I was telling you, you might just be able to pick out Betelgeuse in the nighttime sky. That is Orion the Hunter. And uh, he is such a distinct constellation. He was seen as a great warrior in the sky to many cultures around the world. The Greeks saw him as the greatest hunter of all time. Uh, and uh, had a couple of stories about him. Uh, the Greek, the uh, Chinese people even saw a uh, warrior in the sky. His name was Sung Shu. Uh, and uh, that's an asterism. I'll get into that a little later in the thing. Uh, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about the Greek story behind Orion, Tiffany, or just point him out there? Uh, well, a lot of the Greek stories um, are not uh, family friendly. So <laughs> forgive us for having to water some of this down. Yeah, That's part of why we provided the, the resources in the chat. 
uh, and we'll put those in the YouTube uh, video as well, uh, so that you can, if you're interested in these stories, you can learn a little bit more about them. Um, because I don't know the Greeks, <laughs> the Greeks knew drama. So um, modern the, soap operas got nothing on the Greeks, right? Yes. So the quick, the quick version, uh, the quick and family friendly version here is uh, Taurus the bull on his back. He has this cluster of stars here called the Pleiades. It's also nicknamed the Seven Sisters because if you have dark skies and really good eyes, you might be able to count seven stars there. I can usually only count six, even with really dark skies, but. Uh, that's the seven sisters in Greek mythology. Um, Taurus the bull was protecting the seven sisters from Orion. He was not always a great guy in, in the Greek stories. And uh, so, they're, so they're being protected on Taurus the bull and Taurus and Orion are locked in battle. And um, the, the lion pelt here too comes into play uh, in other stories. We could we can mention later. Um, another interesting thing about the Pleiades, it's one of the most uh, photographed areas of the sky. It's just really beautiful. It's a cluster of stars, and the Japanese call this Subaru. So if you have a Subaru uh, and you look at your the logo of those cars, it might resemble this area of the sky. It's also very important to uh, Japanese culture, their national observatory, which happens to be on Mauna Kea in Hawaii because their light yes. pollution is so bad, is also called a uh, Subaru. Yes, and there's lots of collaboration. The, the really great thing about these big observatories like on Mauna Kea and in Chile, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, they, they have a lot of world collaboration amongst countries. So the Subaru observatory is, um, Japanese, but they collaborate a lot with other culture uh, with other countries to um, to pursue science to pursue astronomy. Mm -hmm. So, as you're moving around to the northern sky, there, Tiffany, uh, Bill asks, "When will you be opening for shows?" And I will tell him that as we speak, we are almost complete with our schedule uh, for the next year. Uh, our plan is to open the weekend after Labor Day. The middle of September is our uh, when we are planning on being opened, and uh, we'll see what the restrictions are like for indoor gathering at that time as to how many people we can have in uh, and uh, what sort of things we're doing. We're working on that now, which is why we're soft opening with the groups to see how our safety plans function. Yes, and um, you know, if, if you guys watch the news, you know that um, things are changing rapidly from the national level and it's trickling down to the state and, and uh, down to the university. So those, those rules and regulations will be changing quickly and we'll, we'll just try to accommodate as we can. Uh, it'll be a process, it'll probably be kind of messy, but we're excited to get started. So uh, I've moved us to the north here. If you guys have seen our star talks, you know that these seven bright stars in our sky make the shape of a big spoon, that's the Big Dipper. And there are so many stories across uh, cultures and across time that talk about the Big Dipper. Basically all civilizations that were in the Northern Hemisphere uh, saw this group of stars. Um, but the Big Dipper is in the constellation Ursa Major or the Big Bear. And um, as Kurt mentioned, we should have probably started with this. Uh, the the International Astronomical Union has written 88 constellations in the sky and has labeled them. And that is the, the names that astronomers use when we're talking about astronomy as a science so that we can all speak the same language, so to speak. Uh, when we talk about new objects that are discovered in the sky, it was found in Ursa Major. So we know where that is, but it's really important. And it's not just these stars either. It's this entire region around these stars. So there is not yeah. a spot in the sky anywhere that is not covered by some kind of constellation, kind of like the states in the United States. Every part of our country is covered by a state uh, of some fashion. Yeah, and you know, Solarium does have the AIU boundary somewhere, but I, <laughs> I did not prepare those, so I'm not sure um, exactly where those are. But yeah, you can imagine this nighttime uh, sky B. carved. What is it? B, as in boy. There you go. So that's the boundary 
B as in boundary for Ursa major. And you can imagine 88 of these carve out every square inch of the sky. Uh, and so that's how we organize our sky today, but that's not, that's not necessarily the right way. That's just the standard way. Uh, ancient civilizations, even current civilizations all over the world um, have made different star patterns. Um, and even ancient civilizations, they were really sophisticated in their understanding of the sky, which we'll get into a little more later, um, but they, they depended on the sky much more than we do today. Uh, the sky was their calendar. It was their clock. Uh, yes, they way... had no cell phones. They had no wrist watches. They watched the passage of time with the stars. Like we said, the sky slowly changes throughout the year, and people were very, very good at looking at the stars and figuring out what time of the year it was. By the way, if you turn everything off and hit W, uh, Tiffany, that'll clear everything. Yeah. Um, so the also, if you go back in time enough, um, books weren't really common in cultures. So if you wanted to pass on your religion, your, your stories to your children and your grandchildren, important aspects of your culture, uh, oftentimes this was done through the stars. So uh, we're gonna share some of those stories that we have. Some of them are, um, you know, some of them are surrounding religious rites and are not always uh, appropriate to tell during certain times of year or if you're not part of that culture. So uh, just something to keep in mind, but a lot of the stories that we're gonna share now have ties to the cultures more than uh, the cultures that they represent more than just a star pattern. So they have deeper meaning than just, oh, it looks like a bear in the sky. But this, it, this does look like a bear in the sky. And Kurt, you were talking before the show about how many cultures see a bear with a long tail. Yes, it wasn't just the Greek people that came up with this weird bear with a long tail. Uh, there are several different Native American cultures that had this story too. Now, something interesting there, this is 5,000 years ago. Christopher Columbus had not come over from the old world to the new world. So how is it possible that cultures from literally all over the world on different sides of oceans could possibly see the same unlikely figure in the nighttime sky. Well, there's no way to prove this, but some archeologists and some astronomers think that it is possible that it wasn't the Greek people or before them, the Babylonian people that came up with this pattern. This pattern might have been in existence before humans crossed uh, from Siberia into Alaska over the Bering Strait back during the Ice Age. And so the story just kind of evolved uh, from those people. If that's the case, this bear with this long tail could be one of the oldest creations of humans still in existence today. Uh, we're talking 15, 20, 30,000 years ago, this might have come into existence. So there's no way to prove that, but it is an interesting and plausible theory. I like to think that the, the stars are connecting us way, way back uh, in time. And, and that's another really great thing about the stars is when you look up at the stars and you see uh, you know, a comet, you know that people hundreds of years ago saw that comet when it came around and uh, these same stars and constellations. It's, it's, uh, it's, I, I, that's what I love about astronomy is that it's brand new, but it's also very historical in nature. So the, the story that I wanted to share with you about the Big, the big Dipper and the Big Bear um, does come from Greek mythology, um, but I tell a, a children's version of it <laughs> if you want the, the real version with Zeus in it, uh, I think that that's in our resources uh, links. But uh, the story is about a mama bear, Callisto, our big bear, Ursa Major, and her baby son, Arcus. Oops, let me get rid of Draco here. Okay, so... We have our Big Dipper, the two stars and the, and the edge of the Big Dipper's cup point to Polaris, our North Pole star, which is in the handle of the Little Dipper, or in the case of our story, the Little Bear. 
And to make it a little more obvious, we'll show this is Callisto, the mama bear, and Arcus, the baby bear. And what, there's one more character in our story. In order to, it, to find him, we need to kind of lay on our back so that we can see more of the sky. So I'm going to zoom out a bit here. We're going to lay in this grass and look directly up. Because high in our sky right now during springtime, it is still the spring, we can use the, big, the two pointer stars in the Big Dipper. If you go the way the water pours out of the cup, you find Polaris. If you go the other direction, you get pretty close to this really bright star here called Regulus. And that is in the heart of Leo the lion. Leo is the king of the springtime skies. Uh, one of my favorite constellations. I love to find him in the sky. He's pretty bright, uh, not quite as bright as the Big Dipper, but uh, bright enough that you can pretty usually spot him in the spring. Uh, and now this story, Leo is not such a nice guy. Uh, Leo was a mean, grouchy lion who was very jealous of all of the animals who had long tails like his. So he ran around and he started nipping off the tails of all of the animals he could find. Now the, ma the mouse was too quick, so he got to keep his long tail. But the bunnies, they have short nubby tails because Leon... Uh, Leo, Leo, <laughs> Leon's my son. Leo, <laughs> the lion, uh, caught the bunnies and nipped off their tails. And so on and on it went. Uh, he, got, he captured all of the bears on the ground and nipped off all of their tails, which is why they have nubby tails today. And he caught all of them except for Callisto and Arcus. They managed to escape they found the tallest mountain that they could find. They ran up that mountain and in desperation, Callisto looked up at the stars and called out for help. Someone please help us, save us from Leo the lion. He's trying to nip off our tails. And Leo was right after them. He was climbing up that mountain, but luckily for Callisto and Arcus, the stars answered back. They said, okay, Callisto, okay, Arcus, climb up this mountain, jump into the sky, we will protect you. So that's what they did. They got to the, top, the, the highest point of that mountain. They jumped into the sky and became these constellations. But Leo was right behind them. So he climbed the mountain too, and he jumped into the sky after them. But the stars kept their promise, which is why Leo the lion is always below the two bears in the sky. You can see him, he's at the feet of Callisto. He can never jump up and nip off their tails. This is a story to help you remember why the bears in the sky have long tails and why or how they're, how they're positioned in the nighttime sky. All right. there, there's many such stories like this one. Uh, and, and Kurt, if you wanna take one, uh, take it over from here to share your springtime stories. Yes, I wanna uh, do a little bit uh, more recent story actually. Uh, not going back to the ancient Greek people, and not even as far back as the Native Americans, but I have a North American story about the sky. If you'll move that around a little more to the east there, Tiffany, sure. after you get that turned on. Um, and uh, I'm sure you've uh, come to my spring shows before. Uh, the Big Dipper is great to star hop around the sky. You can use these stars to maneuver your way around the sky. It's like a key that will unlock the entire night sky for you. No matter what time of the year you're looking at the stars, you can always use the Big Dipper to find stuff up there. So what we're going to do is we are going to take the handle of the Big Dipper and we're going to follow the curve of the handle or make an arc. And when we do that, we're going to actually end up at the fifth brightest star in the entire sky right there. That star is called Arcturus. And what we just did there is we arced to Arcturus. We astronomers are kind of absent-minded. We need these little things to remember these star hops. And uh, the Greek people called the constellation that uh, Arcturus is in Boutes the Herdsman. Uh, another version of the story that uh, Tiffany just uh, told you is uh, uh, um, 
the uh, one of the goddesses, Hera, did not like the bears, and they were punished and had to stay up in the sky all the time. So uh, the herdsman's job was to drive them away from the ground anytime they got close. Uh, but uh, for those of us in Youngstown, I'm sure you've come to our shows and see the Handel's ice cream cone in the sky. That's our modern interpretation of this. Uh, <laughs> but this pattern meant a lot to a group of people just south of us in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, the nighttime sky we mentioned was a calendar, and it just so happens that the star Arcturus rises right at sunset almost to the day of the first day of spring. So it's a very important to start to cultures around the world, including people in the Appalachians. And this is after the Europeans came to the Appalachians. If you've ever been down there, uh, well, let me tell you, they call this Job's coffin, as in Job, the guy from the Old Testament who had to go through all the trials. Uh, you start with Arcturus down there and the star uh, just above it is the bottom of the coffin. And yes. then if you, that one, yes. And then if you draw up to the top, you can see the top of the coffin up there. You can make a pretty good coffin shape out of that. But why would you make it a coffin to begin with? Well, back in the early colonial days, uh, if you've ever been through the Appalachians, you know there are some really isolated communities down there. Um, they're down at the bottom of a valley. There's only one road in and out. Well, back when these uh, places were first starting up, they're, they were small towns. They didn't have a preacher in every single town. They'd have a guy that would go around and serve many of these villages in there. They called them circuit preachers. And at that time, the Sabbath wasn't necessarily Sunday. The Sabbath was whenever the circuit preacher managed to show up, they'd stop working that day and have their church service. Well, this was a problem in the wintertime. The, uh, the circuit preacher, we had snowed into a town for the whole winter and he couldn't serve the other communities he served. And this was really a problem when somebody died because there was nobody that could do last rites on the body. So these towns would keep uh, those who had passed until spring and they would watch for two signs. Uh, one was uh, the, a tree called the Sarbusberry tree. Uh, one of the very first the blooms in the mountains every year. They'd watch for that to bloom and they would watch for Job's coffin to rise in the east right at sunset, which it does at the very beginning of spring. When they saw the uh, those two signs, they knew the circuit preacher around would be coming around to perform the funeral services on those that pass. So that's how the tree got its name. It is actually spelled service, but down there is pronounced sarvus. And uh, that's how Job's coffin got in the sky. So uh, not all the stories you see in the sky are ancient and passed through generations, but most of them do serve a purpose like that. Yeah, so the sky is like a window through time and space. So around the world, we've told stories, but also through, throughout time on, on our earth pretty cool to think about. So I'm moving to the south now. I might have to move forward in time a bit because I'd like to share with you some more, uh, some summer, or wait, we were gonna stay in the east and move forward in time. That's right. Yes. I'm gonna stay in the east. Sorry about that. Uh, because this is our springtime sky and it's high in our sky. It, the reason why we call it springtime is because these constellations, as Kurt mentioned, rise in the east like Job's coffin or Boutis, however you see it. Uh, it rises in the east right as the sun sets in the west. It also and means it's have... almost ice cream season today for us here in Youngstown. So Yeah, I love me some handles. <laughs> um, but so so that means that these these constellations are up all night long. But if you want to see other constellations, um, for example, in the summertime, uh, all you have to do is stay up a little bit later. So as we mentioned, the stars will come up a little bit earlier every night. Um, so over several months by like mid July or so, uh, these will be the constellations you'll see right as the sun sets. But we can see them tonight. We'll just, my um, solarium's a little laggy today. I'm not sure what that's about, but we'll make it work. I'm gonna stay up late. I'm gonna stay up till about midnight or 1 a.m.
Which you can do during the summer. That's always nice. Yes. And when you do that, um, the you'll see three really bright stars that make the shape of a big triangle in the sky. Uh, it's informally called, we often refer to it as the summer triangle. And um, there are, it's, it is inside of our Milky Way galaxy. You can see the band of light here. This is the sort of the center of our galaxy or the plane of our galaxy because the Milky Way galaxy is round and flat like a pancake. And we're inside that pancake looking out. So um, this is where most of the stars in our galaxy are located. There are so many stars in this part of your sky that your eyes can't make out each individual star, so you just see a collective glow. And uh, the dark regions of the Milky Way, which will, will be important later in our talk, those are, we call them the dust lanes, because making stars is messy. And there's a lot of dust and debris hanging around in the Milky Way. And well, we wouldn't dust, be here if it wasn't for that dust either. For, for Yes. If you get it's right very, down to it, because there'd just be hydrogen and helium in the galaxy otherwise, and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that dust, so. Yeah, absolutely. But that's another talk. <laughs> I don't mean to underestimate the dust. The dust is the good stuff. <laughs> it, but it does block out starlight from behind it. So that's why we have the dark regions. There's even more stars on the other side of that dust that we just can't, that's not making it through the dust to our eyes. Um, so the, the Milky Way is in the backdrop of our summer triangle, um, which, which is why the summer is, time is one of the best times to go stargazing. Uh, the Milky Way is up in our summer sky and in our winter sky. So we have lots of bright stars to work with to um, make constellations and other star patterns and um, tell many stories. So one story that we know of uh, from the Chinese, uh, this is an ancient Chinese story that's still celebrated and relevant in today's culture. Uh, but I did wanna take a moment to, to recognize that um, Romans were, uh, have strongly influenced Western culture today. So ancient Romans um, who were influenced by the Greeks and before them, the Babylonians, they, um, uh, their culture in a lot of ways that we don't often recognize in our day to day um, is, is influenced by the Roman culture. Well, in the Eastern world today, a lot of their culture is, is uh, influenced by ancient Chinese. So some of the star lore that we learn about for, from ancient Chinese stories um, does sort of have versions of it in Japan or in Korea and other places like that. But this is one that, that's really celebrated and focused in China right now. It's called the Bridge of the Magpies. So the story is a, a story of love. Okay, so Vega here represents a princess. Her name is Jin Yu, and she was in love with a cow herder named Niu Lang, who is represented by the star Altair. And they, they were in love, but because of some family issues, they were not uh, allowed to be together. So it was a story of forbidden love. And um, they were banished to opposite sides of the Milky Way. They're not allowed to meet again. However, the magpies, which are birds, they were so moved by this couple's love that they uh, once a year will fly into the sky uh, on the seventh day of the seventh lunar month, which is sometimes called the Chinese Valentine's Day. It's their sort of version of a Valentine's Day. Uh, it, the flock of magpies, magpies is said to fly into the sky and form a bridge so that the lovers can reunite for one day out of the year. So on this day, the seventh day of the seventh lunar month, uh, Chinese people, even today, they have a, uh, a festival called the, Ji, the Jishi Festival, where they make uh, sweet cakes and uh, they celebrate love. It's, it's especially important for newlyweds. And they look to the sky, to Vega and Altair uh, to celebrate. Uh, and it said if it rains, that it's a bad, kind of a bad omen for love and that the, um, the 
the couple doesn't meet that year, uh, or if you see a magpie around, then the magpie's not up in the sky to make the bridge. So that's sort of a bad news for our couple as well. A really cute, sweet story that's still, that, that's from a long, long time ago, uh, 2,600 years ago, as is far back as we've heard it told and is still being told and celebrated today. That's actually one thing about the Chinese uh, stories. Uh, they had a written language a lot earlier than a lot of other cultures. So we actually have quite a bit of the Chinese star lore. For example, most of what I, I was talking about, Jin Shu as Orion, that's actually an asterism in the sky, the way the Chinese do it. The main purpose of astronomical observation for them was the calendar bit. Their calendars are tied to the sun and moon cycle which is why you have the year of the rat, the year of the dog, all those different years. If you add all those years up, the, that's the exact number of years it takes to repeat the sun and moon cycle. And, uh, and that's why their holidays don't always line up with our calendars. We have different right. calendars. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, as far as constellations go, they have five regions known as gong in the sky. Um, around the North Star where we were looking earlier, that uh, is the realm of the emperor of the sky, the Jade Emperor. Uh, and everything you see in the heavens is a reflection of Earth. So back during the Chinese Empire, the uh, emperor on Earth was called the Son of Heaven. He was literally the son of the emperor who was Polaris, the North Star. And the whole sky went around that area, and all the stars that are in that area of the sky are the court of the emperor, uh, waiting on him and keeping things aligned in the sky. Uh, the rest of the sky outside of that northern region, they divide it into four parts. Uh, they have well, where we're looking in the spring, that is the azure dragon, also considered their eastern sky. The summer sky was the vermilion bird. Vermilion is a color of red for those of you who don't know. That's considered the southern sky. The fall sky was the white tiger. And the winter sky was the black tortoise. The black tortoise is considered the northern sky. The white uh, tiger is considered the western sky. And when they drew their sky maps, they draw them in that manner. Uh, but like I said, uh, their whole calendar is based on the sun and the moon moving because those are very important events on their calendar. Uh, and everything that happened in the heavens uh, uh, affected events down on the ground, according to these people, a long, long time ago, uh, not necessarily now. Solar eclipses uh, uh, in particular were regarded with fear, and it was a common belief that these occurred because the great dragon, the great azure dragon of spring, uh, was attempting to devour the sun. Uh, forewarning of such event was therefore imperative so people could gather to shout, strike gongs, and scare away the dragon. Over generations of observation, astronomers discovered the relationship we now know as the sorrow cycle, a cycle in which the sun, moon, and earth aligned in a particular way approximately every 18 years and 11 days. And this uh, enabled them to predict solar and lunar eclipses with some accuracy in their calendar. We're talking five, 6,000 years ago, they were able to do this. Um, but it was not an infallible system. Uh, there is a very notable eclipse that happened in the year 2136 BC uh, that was not documented. And uh, it was actually the earliest recorded eclipse in history, but it also tells the fate of the court astronomers, Xi and He, who failed to predict it in advance. Uh, given the belief that such celestial events that reflected events on Earth and should be predicted by the emperor with complete accuracy, uh, complete accuracy was expected of court astronomers, and failure meant only one fate. So astronomers in ancient China got really, really, really good at predicting eclipses after the year 2136 BC. Let's just leave it at that. Um, they... <laughs> As I said, uh, these uh, the 
Sun and Moon always have held significance. We looked a little bit at the moon earlier. Uh, the second most important festival after the Chinese New Year is actually called, is in mid-autumn. It's called the Moon Festival. Uh, and it's held the 15th day of the eighth lunar month when the moon is said to be its largest, roundest, and brightest of the year. The shape of the moon is said to represent completeness and perfection. And the celebration is an important family occasion each year. Special round cakes called moon cakes are uh, made to eat during the festival. I guess the people of Nashville then took that and made them into moon pies here in the <laughs> United States, but uh, they're moon cakes in uh, China. And I, I do want to point out that uh, the ancient Chinese astronomers were incredibly talented. Yes, there was superstition around uh, the stars uh, and, and so, some celestial events like the eclipses, but as a result, they they were one of the the best cultures at the time uh, to to most in terms of accurately measuring uh, and predicting eclipses. And they were also uh, ancient Chinese astronomers were very good at um, tracking comets which is data that astronomers still use today to help them uh, in, in predicting and understanding comets. That's right. Uh, and they were doing this without telescopes and computers. They were just doing yeah. this by observations of the nighttime sky and using actually rather crude instruments to measure distances between things. Yeah, so that's why I don't I don't like painting this sort of picture of, of um, superstitious uh, uh, old, old times and, and a lot of times what we perceive as superstition from the past really had um, important relevance in, in the culture and in their surroundings. So um, as an example, they, we, they also um, saw the, was it the 10, was it in 1064, the, the supernova explosion? 1054. Uh, 10, okay. Uh, so there was a supernova, it's when a star explodes. Uh, and this happens in our galaxy and all over all the time. It's pretty common, but it's common for it's uncommon for stars near us to supernova. Well, in what you said, 1054, is that when it was? Yes. Okay. AD. In 1054 AD, this happened near enough to Earth that uh, it the supernova explosion was so bright that you could even see it during the day. And there's many cultures around that time who had who represented that occurrence in their art, um, and and you can see evidence of it. But in China, they had scientific studies on it, so they they characterized it in a scientific methodical way, which was the only sort of culture that was doing that at the time. So um, early Chinese astronomers were incredibly sophisticated. In their work. Remarkably, nobody in Europe made note of that particular supernova. The only way that the Western cultures learned of it was from Chinese records. Yes, yeah. And so, and so our understanding of what happened um, relies heavily on, on the documentation of those ancient Chinese astronomers. And we can still see that supernova today through a telescope. It's called the Crab Nebula. I believe that's in Taurus, right? Yes, it's the. Uh, horn closest to Orion is the Crab Nebula is right around that star. And it's beautiful uh, through a telescope. But so the supernova in 1054 was so bright uh, that you could see it during the day. I think they said uh, estimated around three months or so. And then it, it faded. And now we have remnants of that still in our sky. But you it's dim enough that you have to use a telescope to see it. Pretty cool. All right, so we're going to shift um, to our summertime sky. So we're still in our summertime sky, which you can see late tonight if you stay up. If you're laying Tiffany, on your, your uh, stellarium looks really fuzzy right now. Yeah, it's, it's very, very hard to see. it's very laggy and I'm not sure why. Um, I can, here, let me just turn it off and turn it back on again. That's, that's the secret to all technical <laughs> problems. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, all right, so it might take us a minute to get the um, the sky set back up, but we'll we'll set back up to the summertime sky and we'll look towards our south, so we can see some of the constellations that we'll be able to find um, in your sky, 
during the summer in the South, SSS, that's how I remember it. Uh, and these will be constellations that you can look at while we don't, in our um, interim, so we, we're not going to be doing a lot of virtual programming in this uh, in the summer. So these are some constellations. And Tiffany, if you still have problems, let me know. I can start mine up and share it, mine if you have trouble. It is moving much better. So let's see. Oh, good. Let's give it a try. All right. I'm sharing my screen. It seems to be moving better. Let's move forward in time. Oh, it looks better. Good. All right, so it's by default, it starts at current time. So I'm gonna move forward to about 1 a.m. That's oh, about 2 a.m., but that's good. That's perfect. Okay, so this is about 2 a.m. tonight, but again, um, these are the constellations that you'll be able to see really good in your summertime sky in July. These, these will be high in your south sky during the summertime. And they all start with the, the two that I wanted to mention, start with the letter S, so south summertime and uh, Sagittarius is this one i'm not going to go into it too much um but just went this, blocky again hmm. it went blocky again huh okay mm -hmm. uh this is the constellation scorpius and um scorpius is uh, a scorpion in um greek mythologies but in other cultures they see different things for example uh, Pacific Islanders, who were uh, phenomenal wayfarers, used the stars to navigate. Um, but well, well before there was GPS, they would use the stars to navigate incredibly long distances uh, across the sea. And this is one of their markers. They used the tail of Scorpius, uh, and they called this Maui's hook. So if you've seen the show, uh, the Disney movie Moana, they talk about um, Maui's hook. You can rewatch that and see the, in the show what you're looking at there is what we know of today as uh, Scorpius the scorpion. The the short version of the story is he was fishing with his hook and snagged the bottom of the ocean, but he thought he caught a great fish, so he heaved and pulled and he heaved and he actually pulled the Hawaiian islands out of the ocean uh, with the hook, and that's the hook that did it. Wow. So we uh, wanted to talk, we've been really focusing on the Northern Hemisphere and a lot of cultures in the North that, that uh, can see the Northern part of the sky. So I wanted to move us down to, um, to the Southern sky. So what I'm gonna do is take us to one of my favorite places on earth. We'll, we'll go to Chile. Uh, Chile is a, a, today is a place, um, a, a really wonderful place for astronomy. It's where one of the, uh, many of the world's best telescopes are built. And uh, we're, I just moved us to La Serena, uh, which is, is the larger beach town city, very close to many of these, uh, about 45 minute drive or so from many of these um, really big observatories. And uh, this was outside of, um, uh, Tiffany, uh, once again, it's gone really, really fuzzy. Do you want me to call up my Stellarium and try this? Sure. Okay. Uh, you know what? It could be that I have the, um, I'm sorry about this, guys. Let me try one more time because it we, could, we have problems like this in the real planetarium too, so. I optimized for video for our intro. Ah. So maybe it's, um, I bet that's what it is. It's not video. We'll see. Let me know if it gets fuzzy again and then we'll switch over. Oh, now that's much, much clearer. Okay, sorry about that, guys. I'm sure that the sky's been a little blurry, but hey, that's just a great reason to come visit us in September where we have yeah. a really- Our stars look great with Kronos. Yes. Great with Kronos. Fantastic. You can't duplicate that on a computer screen. And in the, and the meantime, I guess you can go out and look at the real stars. <laughs> Those are pretty cool too. <laughs> yeah, but you got light pollution. We can get rid yeah. of our light pollution. You usually do have to travel pretty far out. And that's one nice thing about um, where when I visited um, in Chile, it, again, it was about 45 minutes from La Serena, which is a beach town and it does have light pollution. But if you go in a little bit further, 
inland closer to the Andes Mountains, uh, you have really dark skies. And it was in that area that I, I first heard um, some Andean, Andean lore uh, stories, so star lore stories from the native Andeans. Um, they lived on either side of the Andes, I guess they do still live on either side of the Andes Mountains, either in Chile or in Argentina. Um, and Juan Fernandez, who is uh, an Andean um, star lore storyteller, this is what he does is he sort of passes along these stories. Uh, he shared with us one, um, one story about um, the Milky Way and gave us permission through the Big Astronomy Project to share that story. So if you want it in greater detail, that's also linked in our resource, our resources. But uh, may I point out that a great show that none of you have seen yet is called Big Astronomy, People, Places, and Objects. That is going to be our signature show in the upcoming public season. Uh, we will be showing that in February of next year, and it is fantastic. You're going to love it. And the Ward Beach Planetarium has a part in it. Yes, yes, it's a wonderful project where we really discuss, um, you learn more about the astronomy that's happening in Chile and all the different kinds of people it takes to make these really big scientific uh, discoveries possible. It's a really great show and I'm so excited to share it with you guys. But in the meantime, we can share with you a little bit of, of the culture, uh, some of the Chilean cultures. Uh, so the um, the Andeans, to help them remember important patterns in the sky, um, many of them took myths and legends that were already important into their culture and assigned them to the stars. Or in the case of the Andean people, they assigned dark lanes of the bright Milky Way. So they used a combination of bright stars in the Milky Way with the dark dust lanes to make shapes or constellations and tell stories that way. So the one of the most important uh, star patterns in the Southern Hemisphere sky for many cultures in the Southern Hemisphere is the crux or the, su the Southern Cross. It's four really bright stars there. It's small, but it's so bright and distinct and very clearly a, a cross shape. Uh, so in Andean culture, this was called the, Chicana, the Chicanya. And um, it represents balance and symmetry. So the sky and the earth, the sun and the moon, day and night, balance and symmetry. So the Southern Cross can also be used to help you find the South Pole. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, we're lucky we have Polaris that points to the, it, it hovers directly over the North Pole. There is no star that hovers directly over the South Pole. But the, the best way that you can find the South Pole is to use the length of crux for the Chicanya and repeat it three times. So one, two, three, and this dark region right here is, yeah, I got it a little bit off, but it's the, it's the South Pole. That will, and so all the stars in the Southern Hemisphere appear to rotate around that dark area of the sky. Now, next to the uh, crux or Chicania is a dark region that astronomers call the coal sack, but the Andeans call this a frog. So they make a, a frog out of this dark region here. You can kind of see its back and then the front there. The behind the frog here is the called the la is a llama or the big llama called the Yakanya. So the way that you can see the big llama is this is Alpha and Beta Centauri, which are uh, two of the three stars that are closest to our star system. Those make the eyes of our llama. So these are the eyes of Yakama, Yakanya, sorry. And then here's the nose, the ears, and the body. Her body goes down the Milky Way this way. And the Antares and, the, and this other bright star here make the eyes of a baby llama that's sort of under the mama llama's belly. So the story goes that Yakanya, in the beginning of time, uh, the father of everything, he was looking up at the emptiness of earth 
and he was feeling sad over the lack of beauty. So he sent one of his most beautiful daughters to her, the Lacanya. That's how, that's why we have llamas. He gave her the mission to create beauty. She created the water and the winds, but she felt alone. So she went back to the sky and asked her father for help. He sent the fox, which is represented just behind the llama back here. These, this really dark region is where the fox is. The fox is a smart spirit. Fox called the frog, this dark region by the Southern Cross, and the frog brought rain, which brought fertility to the land. The snake, which, you, which is I, is represented by the bright star Acrux in the, in the uh, Chicania. The snake comes, that's the eye of the snake, and he snakes down here. Uh, the snake came and helped. The snake, whose eye is marked by the bright star here, um, it brought knowledge to earth. So just as all people over the world use constellations to track the passage of time and to navigate, so do the Andeans. Um, they use this story to help them mark the passage of time. In the summer, high in the Andes, the llamas are moved from the mountains to feed down in the grasses. Uh, and people knew when to move their llamas because uh, that was when the baby llama right here was touching the Andes mountains. They knew it was time to move their llamas down to feed. Uh, and this is also the time of year when the frog is upside down. And when you see the frog uh, upside down, rains, that's a signal that rain is coming. So this is an example of how people can tell stories uh, of the sky to help them remember uh, and, and to help them track different events that are happening in the natural wor world around them. And these traditions do continue even today. Now, we've just covered Chinese culture, Mayan culture, <laughs> uh, Greek culture, Appalachian culture, but we've barely scratched the surface here. There are literally stories from all around the world uh, that deal with uh, the nighttime sky. So, uh, you can find a lot of them around online. We share them in our live star talks, but we hope we uh, show that uh, the night sky is a great way of preserving culture and uh, it'll help your curiosity to go out and explore some more. Yes, and, and that's what we, we hope to do is to, to encourage you to go out and look up and um, feel a little connected to the to the stars. I hope that that's your your summer homework for me. Is <laughs> go outside and look up at some point. Um, but in the meantime, um, that's what you can do in the meantime. And then in the summer, or I'm sorry, in September, in the fall, please come and see us. I would love to see you. I've missed you all. Um, yes, we we dearly miss our public shows. And we've got a few changes in the planetarium for you to see when you come. Uh, we're getting everything tuned back up and ready to roll. Uh, and uh, you, you just can't beat looking up on the dome and seeing the stuff too. So we can't wait to show you. Uh, we'll be bringing back some old favorites. We've we'll got some new stuff you haven't seen yet. Uh, and in addition to big astronomy, one culture we didn't hit a lot on uh, that's going to be featured early in our season in November, or is it September? I can't remember off the schedule, but we have a great show on Mayan archaeoastronomy. Yes. Uh, well, that's brand new. Nobody's seen that yet either. I think that that's going to be early in our season because we're running it uh, during uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, which is like mid -September. I think it's September. Yeah, it's mid-September to mid-October, so I'm pretty sure we're doing that in September, and it's a really great show. If you, especially if you like this uh, show tonight, um, the, the star stories in that film are fantastic, and, and it's And for our veterans out there, don't worry, Big Bird and Elmo will be back as well. <laughs> We've got lots of great stuff planned, so please come and visit us in the fall. Um, if you, I, I'm, I'm seeing some comments, but not, uh, not any questions. So if you do have questions, uh, leave them in the comments and we'll come back. We like to check back every now and then and, uh, and see, and we'll answer your questions in the comments. Otherwise have a wonderful evening.
a wonderful summer and remember to keep looking up.